Good evening and welcome to CPI Talks. My name is Ashokan. I'm the Executive Director of uh, Waterloo Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute, CPI, which is the host of the CPI Talks. CPI Talks uh, is a public outreach lecture series, uh, which is a new initiative by CPI that we launched uh, last fall. Today's CPI Talk is the third in the series, and we hope to have about four to six talks every year, roughly once every two, three months. As a public outreach initiative, the intended audience is the general public, uh, which means that uh, we don't assume any prior knowledge or expertise in cybersecurity or privacy. Uh, the idea is to invite world leading experts, both from CPI and from our colleagues around the world uh, to explain important cybersecurity and uh, privacy issues to the public at large. Uh, in particular, we welcome uh, high school students and uh, um, early undergrads uh, so that they can get a flavor of uh, what cybersecurity and privacy are like. Um, so our speakers are uh, well-known experts and role models, and our hope is that some of you in the audience, especially the students, will be inspired by the topics and the speakers uh, to consider specializing in uh, cybersecurity and privacy yourselves. So today we have two such speakers, um, both of whom are uh, experts from CPI. Uh, I will introduce them in a minute, uh, but uh, as usual, let me start with the territorial acknowledgement. So many of us uh, who um, work at the University of Waterloo and live in the neighborhood acknowledge that uh, much of our work and life takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus, uh, the University of Waterloo campus is located on the Haldimand Tract the land that's granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on uh, each side of uh, Grand River. Um, so each of us, uh, I invite uh, each of you and each of us to reflect on the fact that uh, we live in the territory, you live and work in the territory of uh, um, these uh, three nations. So let me introduce our uh, speakers for today. Uh, Dr. Mika Lemoska is a professor at the Department of Combinatorics and Optimization. Um, he's a well-known expert in quantum computing in general and quantum cryptography in particular. Um, it, it's, it would be no exaggeration to say he's uh, Canada's most influential thought leader in these topics. Uh, his contributions are too many to list uh, exhaustively, uh, but I'll highlight a couple. Uh, he has founded uh, multiple startups in this domain. Uh, he co-chairs the board of the Quantum Industry Canada, and he's a co-founder of uh, uh, IQC, the Institute for Quantum Computing at Waterloo. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Sarah Zafar Jafarzadeh. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Combinatorics and Optimization, and is an expert in quantum uh, and post-quantum cryptography. Having done her doctoral research with uh, Gilles Bressard and Louis Salve both of whom are leading experts in quantum cryptography. Uh, she is also a member of uh, IQC. So with that, I invite uh, Dr. Maskar and Dr. Jaffer Zadeh uh, to um, start their lecture. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Aspen, for the nice introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. So today we are going to talk about um, uh, quantum era and are we ready for uh, the quantum era? But before going into that topic, I would like to tell you a little bit about how did I get into the field of quantum computing and quantum cryptography in particular. So I here's 
when I was in the plane to come to Canada for the first time for my PhD, I did my master in artificial intelligence. And it was around the time that social media was getting more and more popular among people. I could see my friends uh, posting every single thing that happened to them or to their friends publicly on Facebook at the time uh, and sharing every single thing that happened in their life. Also, I could see how much information me as an individual can deduct from just seeing who like what or what are their posts open to and stuff like that. And there's not, not much you can do uh, when people voluntarily share their information publicly with others, right? Other than informing them about the threats they're putting themselves uh, on it. So I, so I start like, getting into learning more about privacy and security and how important it is to protect your information, especially since like people and companies were finding interest in big data and like, you know, uh, trying to use user information in a way that the user were not necessarily aware about that. So, it's, so as I was looking into where to go to do my PhD, I get to learn more about cryptography and in particular learning a little bit about quantum cryptography. So I applied to University of Montreal and I started my PhD under the supervision of Professor Hugo Sir. Uh, at that time, I did not honestly know much about quantum cryptography, not even like close enough to it. Uh, so I took a course in quantum information uh, theory with Jill on my second semester, which introduced me to the field of quantum cryptography. And I ended up writing my thesis on that, and I graduated in 2020. Um, so now let's get technical and talk about like uh, quantum era. So before that, I want to take you to a thought experience. Imagine you live in a house that is, uh, so you live in a smart house, you can control almost everything, every feature that and every devices you have in your house remotely. Uh, you can control the cameras, uh, see the videos like what's going on around your house and inside your house remotely from wherever in the world you can control the lights turn them on and off and also see what are the rooms that the lights are on you can control the temperature turn on your coffee maker just before going to the house arriving home and like put it on a temperature that you desire to. You can define new user to have access to different devices at your house remotely or access your house, enter your house. And uh, all the other fun features that we see that IoT are bringing to us these days. Also, you own a self-drive car, which can take you wherever you want, whenever you want. With uh, So life seems really, really easy, right? You can also, this day with pandemic, we see that like connection with our doc, uh, physicians and other specialists is happening remotely also. They can uh, control and observe some of your health related features, for example, measures. Uh, you can share your heartbeat measure or blood sugar level or stuff like that remotely with your doctor, no matter where you are or where the doctor is located. They can send you prescriptions uh, without ever stepping into their office and so on and so forth. So it seems that world is getting more and more close to get uh, than it was ever before and life is becoming more easier and convenient. Uh, for users, for, for everyone. But there's a flip into it. it. As much as it's getting easy, it's also getting more and more scary. Because how can I make sure that nobody else other than myself and people who are authorized by me can have access to control devices in my house? How can I make sure that nobody can control over my house and like lock me in somehow or control over my self-drive car and cause an accident or kill me or like you know other people how can you make sure that the prescription that you receive indeed it was like coming from your 
uh, a specialist and it was not uh, altered or someone else, an adversary, an enemy did not uh, send you that prescription. So it is important to make sure that we are as far as we are getting into IoT and remote control and ease of life, we are also considering the other side of it, which is like privacy and cryptography. So it's exactly like in your life, when you want to build the house, you make sure that you are building your house on a strong foundation, right? Because otherwise, no matter how much money you are investing in building the instruction of your house with a, a small wind can blow it and like all your investment can go away. The similar thing can happen in digital life. So you need to be able to make sure uh, in the digital life you have a level of safety and security. And how can you achieve this level of safety and security is by cryptography. So cryptography provides us with the tools that can, if we use it correctly, we can protect ourselves uh, from those threats that I mentioned and all the threats that I did not mention because of the time um, and be able to have a convenient life and safe life at the same time. So, but what does cryptography really mean? Well, it means many things. It means confidentiality. For example, when your doctor, let's assume that uh, this is your doctor, this is a doctor and this is a patient. The doctor wants to send a prescription to the patient or wants to share some personal, you know, health related information with this patient. It wants to make sure, and they're remote, so they're going to use like some kind of channel to communicate with each other. And this channel can be tampered or like eavesdrop uh, by, by a third party, which is not supposed to learn those private information, of course. So you can, uh, so how can the doctor make sure that the message that she's sending will only be readable or accessible to his patient? So one way to think about it is that like the doctor have a safe that the key to the safe is already pre-shared between herself and the patient and no one else has the key to this safe. This safe has an extra property which if you do not have the key you will not be able to open it, you cannot break it, there's no way to break it unless you have the key to access the information inside it unless you have the key. So the doctor write, writes that private information on a piece of paper, put it in a safe, lock the safe, send it through that public channel to its patient. Uh, an adversary who try to listen to this private channel can learn nothing about it, uh, about what was the message. But the patient, since he has the key can unlike the safe and also like uh, learn the message that the doctor wanted to communicate uh, with the patient. And uh, so this is called confidentiality also encryption. Cryptography also means integrity. And what does integrity means? Let me explain it to you with an example that we use every, almost like every day in life. So when you go to an online checkout or when you go to a supermarket, do shopping and then go to the cashier to pay for your shopping, after you insert your call or just before you tap your card or your cell phone on the post devices, you need to agree to the total amount, uh, which is the uh, value of the stuff that you have purchased, right? And you want to make sure that that total amount is what will be taken out from your bank account and be paid to the merchant, right? You want to have a kind of guarantee that if I say like $10 be take out from my account, it's not gonna be changed into $10,000 somehow. And that is guaranteed to through a primitive calls integrity of the message. It also means authentication and identification. And uh, so 
identification is very simple like we see it all the time uh so when you want to connect to your bank account or you want to log into your to a portal to connect to your uh, medical service provider you enter your username and password and since you are the only one who knows that username and password so they know that it is you and like authentication will be the case that when you receive a message from your doctor you want to make sure that that message definitely this prescription was definitely prescribed by your doctor and uh, not a, nobody else so it's like that is called like message authentication so these are like the most popular features uh when you talk about cryptography to people that comes like immediately in mind and there are some of the most the oldest features but it also means a secure multi-party computation it means secure outsourcing computations to untrusted part parties protecting privacy and retain uh, security at the same time or protecting privacy and achieve business function uh, functions uh, and much more so i'm not going to go through the details of what each of these uh, features means an application of that is like for example using homomorphic encryption for anti-money laundering uh, which can be used in many uh, places so now uh, that we learn uh, what does uh, a little bit what does cryptography means let me tell you like the second part of our talk which is what is quantum era in general so before that i want to tell you what does a quantum what is a quantum computer well a quantum computer is fundamentally different from a classical computer and by classical computer i mean your laptop or your pc or whatever devices that you use right now to connect to the to connect to the zoom uh, and listen to this talk and quantum computer are not about uh, miniaturization uh, anymore it's not about most law quantum computers are computational devices that harness the fundamental laws of quantum physics to perform computations. So to understand why like these fundamental laws of quantum physics are so important, imagine that when like many, many, many years ago, when we were people assuming that the Earth was flat. So there was some of the, you know, like uh, material you could explain it, but to certain threshold. After like a certain threshold, things were happening and we could not like explain them. Then they realized that, oh, uh, by the way, like Earth is not, a, uh, it's not a flat, it's a sphere. So then like this, then the, uh, then they could like explain much more things that were not explained with the old uh, assumptions that they have. So for quantum computers is the same. So it is based on this new, more detailed from the uh, uh, microscopic level uh, of laws, uh, which are called laws of quantum physics. But let me tell you what are those laws. So one of them is superposition. And what does the superposition mean is that like a classical bit is in a state zero or one. You can represent a state zero uh, with an atom which has an electron in a grounded state and the one with an atom which has an electron in excited state. A quantum bit on the other side can be at the state zero and one at the same time uh, which this is an example of a quantum bit which we call it is in a superposition of zero and one at the same time and this like a weird looking number here are called amplitude that if you look closely to them you will see that it's actually a square root of half and there is a lot about this amplitude and we can like that we can get advantage of them 
in a smart way to do things that are not really possible in classical world or do things that are in quantum world that are much more efficient than in classical world. The second law uh, of uh, quantum physics is interference. Like just like waves that they can have constructive and destructive interference, quantum uh, bits can also have constructive or destructive interference. For example, in this, uh, in this image, you can see a constructive interference between two waves. So, which result into a stronger wave and these two that cancel each other uh, basically is a destructive interference. And in quantum algor algorithm is that is the art of using this interference in a smart way to achieve some functionality and some um, computa uh, 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 computational uh, solve some computational problem that are not possible to do it classically otherwise. And the third one is entanglement. Uh, and what does entanglement mean is imagine you have two quantum bits that are at the same time in a state zero zero and at the same time in a state one one. But once you look at them, so let's say that you distribute this two qubit to two party, you make them go far, far away from each other. And then like one party look at its qubit, like meaning that measure it. If that person see that his qubit has collapsed to a state zero, knows for sure that if the other party look at his qubit will observe the state zero as well. And they are much more into like entanglements than just this correlation that I mentioned here. And it's like really powerful concept that give us a lot of things in, especially in quantum cryptography. So these laws of quantum physics can enable us uh, to achieve some um, uh, to achieve some functionality. So how does quantum computing impact our life? Where, for example, we can use it uh, for designing new materials like drugs and etc. We can use it, as I said, for optimization problem or sensing and measuring. We can use it for secure communication. And there must be much, there, there might be much more uh, impact and use cases for quantum computing than we know really today. So one of these impacts is, as I said, secure communication, which is also called quantum cryptography. Uh, one of the most famous and well-known quantum cryptography protocol are quantum key distribution invented by uh, Charlie Bennett and Gilles Brassard from University of Montreal, which was invented in 84. And it's called after the inventors. So Bennett and Brassard, BB, and then 84, the year that it was uh, implemented, that it was, the paper was published. And it's based on a very simple and elegant idea. So the novelty of this work, of this protocol, was basically thinking that you can use the laws of quantum physics to achieve some cryptography tasks. So let's assume that you have two parties called Alice and Bob, or who are far away from each other. And they have at their disposal only a public quantum channel. And you can think about it of a public quantum channel of a fiber optic channel and an authenticated public classical channel. And what do I mean by authenticated public classical? channel is that like a channel that whatever information you put on it everybody in the world can learn about it may learn about it but if they tamper the information that was transmitted via this channel there's Alice and Bob can detect it 
so uh, so it, so therefore the information is authenticated means that you can verify if it was indeed this information was sent by Alice and Bob can like uh, very uh, verify that it's the information have come from Alice and the other way around as well and uh, with quantum key establishment use the this extra property that quantum bits have uh, which is called detecting eavesdropping. So if Alice send the qubit through a quantum channel, an adversary attempt to tamper with the qubit or learn what was the information encoded into that qubit can be detected, this uh, eavesdropping attempt by Alice and Bob, which we do not have the equivalent of it in classical world. So quantum key establishment enable Alice and Bob to establish secret keys using only an authenticated public classical channel and a public quantum channel. And the authenticated public classical channel is a very weak assumption. And this cannot be achieved actually classically in this strong security way that is provided with quantum key establishment. Well, as I told you, like quantum computing is bringing a lot of advantage to our life, protecting our security in a way that it was not possible before, but it also has some disadvantages. That I will pass it to my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Moscow, to talk about it. Thanks so much, uh, Sarah. Uh, it's a great, uh, great first half of this uh, presentation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So indeed, um, you know, I got into this um, just a few years before uh, uh, Sarah did. In fact, I remember meeting before a couple of years before I, I started working in quantum computing. I was working in cryptography, trying to break a lot of the codes we use, the kinds of codes we use today. And I knew her supervisor, uh, Gilles Brassard, because of his famous work in cryptography. Uh, so when I met him for the first time in 1994, I was excited to talk to him and saying, well, so what are you working on now? And he just quantum this, quantum that, quantum cryptography, quantum computing. And I thought, oh, you know, what a shame. He's really obsessed with this quantum stuff. Uh, but then quite ironically, a couple of years later, I ended up realizing uh, that this was actually a really interesting field to be working in and, and switched to the field myself and have been working in it for over, over a quarter century now. So why was I working in it? So Sarah just mentioned that, you know, with um, quantum, one of the wonderful things quantum information, quantum technology brings us is a way to establish secret keys which you can use to encrypt and do other things where there's no mathematical assumption where you, you, you can't mathematically hack it. So that sounds super exciting, right? Um, on the other hand, if you talk to security experts, they'll say, you know what? Like all the hacking we see today is not done by people breaking the very, very bottom, like the very fundamental mathematical codes. They do something generally a little more mundane than that. I don't want to say it's mundane, but in a relative scale, you know, breaking the fundamental mathematics of cryptographies, you know, that's super hard stuff that rarely ever happens. Uh, whereas, you know, it's like when you want to, when criminals break into your house, or hopefully they don't break into your house, when they break into houses, they don't typically pick the lock, right? The locks aren't perfect, but those aren't the weakest links. They find some other easier way to get in, like a window or they go under the mat, or they pretend to be your cable person, right? But imagine, uh, you know, they could, you know, the, the, the pad, you know, the keypad codes, but there was just some digital key that, where well, you could just walk in the front door without doing any of that, without climbing through the window, right? You know, because you, you start to look a little suspicious when you do these things, right? When you're climbing through a window and so on. But if you had a, a digital, if you had a master key, that, then obviously you'd have a problem. Uh, so 
you know, just because typically you don't pick the lock to break, criminals don't pick locks to break into people's homes, the conclusion is not, therefore, let's not bother putting in locks, right? Because if we didn't lock our doors, uh, then, then they, we'd have a problem. Then they would be taking advantage of those weak locks. Uh, and so one of the reasons that we need something like quantum key agreement, well, two reasons. One, you know, these codes, while they're maybe hard to break and currently the, the, you know, the strongest link in the chain, there, are, there have been examples in history where they went from being secure to not being secure. And, you know, one of the risks of breaking a very, very fundamental building block is if it's broken, everything built out of it is broken. Right. And as one of my colleagues, Paul Kosher, said at a, at a conference a couple of years ago, we kind of know what happens when one percent of our systems go down on any given day. We don't really know how bad it gets when all of our systems or most of our systems go down. Right. So like a one percent chance of everything collapsing. That, that's an unacceptable risk if these are very critical systems. Right. So we don't, we've never really experimented with that. And, and I, I think it's pretty clear that would be very bad. Um, and we, we kind of live with that risk already. And so something like QKD takes one of these systemic risks off the table, the risk that a smart mathematician figures out how to break these codes. And, and then suddenly criminals have a digital master key. Again, most of the breaks are, you know, software bugs, user error, you know, insiders, and we have people at CPI that work on all of these really important problems, software assurance, the human side of cybersecurity, and so on. And those are all very important, and we absolutely keep have to keep protecting those uh, weaknesses. Uh, and they work on you know, human computer interface, usable security, which are all really uh, important issues. At the same time, we have to make sure the building blocks of all these tools that we use remain secure. And that's how I got into quantum. When I first heard of it, I heard the following, right? So what I was working on back then were mathematical codes that we use, again, as building blocks of these secure protocols, the things we use to secure VPNs. Or when you do secure web browsing, you know, if you ever see HTTPS and you're securely doing online shopping and so on, or security interacting with your doctor online, that S is built out of public key cryptography almost all the time. Um, and it depends on certain problems. So we want some things to be hard, right? Quantum computing is exciting because it makes a lot of things that were previously impossible, possible. But we have to also see well, what risks does that capability introduce? And one situation where we want something to be hard is we want it to be hard to break the codes that we use, right? And, and one of the most common codes used today is built on the fact that multiplying large numbers and getting the product is really easy. But if I give you the product, finding the prime factors is it's pretty, pretty hard uh, on today's technology with class regular computers, except if you could take advantage of superposition and interference and so on, it's actually really easy, right? And you can't do the standard tricks of using a bigger key or a bigger you know, message or whatever. It, it won't work because breaking the code is about as easy as making it. We can't break all codes. We can just break the codes we happen to be using today, right? So there's a problem. And fortunately, you know, Peter Shaw realized this in 1994, right? Before these kinds of quantum computers that could wreak all this havoc had been built. So we've had time to, to do something about this, right? We know what to do about it, right? The obvious thing is, well, take those codes built out of factoring and discrete logs, as we call them, and use some other hard math problem, right? How hard could that be? Well, it's hard, right? Uh, many of the smartest mathematicians and cryptographers in the world have worked for decades to find a really small set of, of mathematical tools that could replace the existing ones. The beauty of this approach is it's all, you don't need quantum technology, right? You use classical codes to defend against quantum attacks, right? which is great, it's a David versus Goliath situation where you don't want, you don't want to have to do a heroic effort, right, to defend yourself for everyday transactions when you're shopping at the grocery store or just wanna log in and check in with your doctor or whatever, right? So that's the beauty of these post-quantum algorithms as they're called. 
regular zeros and ones using any conventional communication uh, information technology. But as I alluded to before, you know, there's good enough security, but sometimes good enough isn't good enough, right? For very critical systems, you can't take a chance, a 1%, 5%, 10% chance that a smart mathematician somewhere in the world figures out how to break these codes and can penetrate a large fraction of our digital platforms. And again, a systemic and a sustained way. It's not an overnight job to fix these codes. It's not like Heartbeat, which was fixed within hours of people knowing how to do it, at least fixed. The software is fixed, and then it took up to a year to properly deploy the fix to Heartbleed. But that was, in a sense, a very, very easy fix. These kind of fixes take years, decades even. So, you know, for a systemic system, you can't really, you know, it's, this is a great first line of defense, but you need some additional line of defense. And up until now, those additional lines of defense were not so elegant to scale. It's literally a person with a briefcase transporting keys or, or, or other types of mechanisms which work, but not so easy to scale and come with other costs and risks. And it would be hard to imagine scaling to, again, in the 90s, you know, we thought it would be bad if the internet collapsed in the 90s, of course, but it'd be a lot worse today, right? And it's going to be a lot more impactful in 10 years. So as we try to, like the kinds of systems we'll need to protect the number of endpoints and so on just grow, are just growing you know, exponentially. So, you know, having an army of people carrying secret keys around is not an option. So we need something else to augment those, those old school methods. And quantum cryptography, which Sarah mentioned, is a beautiful new addition to our tool chest. It's not a replacement. For some reason, some people like to say, oh, that old stuff is garbage. Here's the new stuff. That's you know, we have a human tendency to oversimplify things. The old stuff and the improved versions of the old, you know, the old stuff is amazing. It's truly enabling. And we can supplement, we can mitigate its weaknesses with quantum cryptography in many cases, right? You do need some limited amount of quantum technology, okay? But it's not like a full-fledged quantum computer in most cases. For the quantum cryptography Sarah was talking about, it's technology that's been available for 20 years. Of course, it keeps getting better, but this is commercially available for many years. Uh, so it's not uh, a Star Trek type uh, technology we're, we're, we're just describing here. Again, these tools work very well together and enable security functionalities and levels of security that were previously not believed to be possible even. Right? So they're very complementary uh, tools and, and the quantum crypto is, is a great addition to this tool chest. So I've alluded to this already. This is not a weekend job, right? Upgrading your cryptography from one algorithm to another. Right? This is not a Tuesday, you know, patch update. It takes years of planning to do this properly. It's, it's, you know, these are all sorts of different standards, right? Things need to interoperate. You need to be able to validate them, right? All sorts of rules and regulations that we need. Just, it's just a miracle that the global telecommunication system even works, right? you really start thinking about it, the amount of coordination uh, that's in there uh, is remarkable. So you can't just decide, hey, you know, 120 volts and the plugs we use in Canada, let's just switch to something else. Like you can't, these take years, right, to do these kinds of migrations. So we need to start, right? Well, how soon do we need to start, right? It depends on, on three important parameters. One is how sensitive, how long is the information you want to protect? How long does it need to be protected? Again, your personal health information, your DNA information, decades. Other information, maybe not so important, like a day and everything in between. The second, let's call that X. So it's X years. That's how long you're supposed, these tools are supposed to protect the information. Why is the amount of time it takes to retool the existing infrastructure? And this sometimes requires replacing deployed embedded hardware with new hardware. So it can take many years to do these things. But there's all sorts of countless, you know, there's the design, testing, standardization, and so on phases. So it can take many years to retool an infrastructure. It really depends on all sorts of things. Like how much is it one entity 
you know, if Microsoft wanted to update its auto updates mechanisms, it can kind of do it quickly because it's the client and the server. But in most scenarios, nobody's you know, monolithic and can just do what it wants. So it takes time. You want to maintain interoperability and so on. So why it can be many years? It really depends on the complexity of the system. One thing I would say is don't try to rush a migration because if you do, remember I said earlier, you know, today's hacking is usually mundane things like software bugs, which are really hard to avoid. And then, you know, so it's, it's not, you know, programmers are very talented, but there's inevitably going to be bugs. If you rush, you're going to make a lot more mistakes, right? And you're going to open yourself up, not just to systems crashing for no for usual reasons, but cyber attackers can take advantage of those mistakes. So you don't want to rush migration. And lastly, when will these large scale quantum computers that Sarah told us about, when will they be big enough to be able to break the codes that currently protect us? And that will continue to protect us more and more in the next five, 10, 15 years. How long before we have such a quantum computer? Right? That's the billion dollar question. But the important thing in terms of when do I need to start for the next Y years, we're all stuck with the quantum vulnerable tools. Right? For any specific tool, because it might be five years for some tools and 10 for another and 15 for another. We have Y years to migrate. For the next Y years, by definition, we're stuck, we're, we're kind of vulnerable, right? People could be recording that information and archiving it, right? And it's supposed to be secure for X more years. But if X plus Y is bigger than Z, you're already too late, right? Too late in the sense that these, there's vulnerabilities that you really shouldn't have. Right, because what happens at the end of those Y years, you're still using your VPN that is quantum vulnerable. Potentially adversaries are recording that traffic. It's supposed that information is very sensitive. It's supposed to be secure for X years, but it won't be, right? It'll be vulnerable. It's not guaranteed an adversary was collecting it. It's not guaranteed they're going to exploit it to come after you, but that vulnerability is there. So you'd need to do a full-fledged risk assessment to decide. If it's something, how badly you need to worry about this, but for a critical system, um, you really, you do need to worry about this because some of the assets uh, being, being protected are going to be sensitive and don't want to be vulnerable and will be targeted. And so this is the, you know, the famous X, Y, Z equation of quantum risk management. And back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, the answer was, well, maybe. Now, I think for any remotely critical digital platform, you should have started yesterday. So, but what is Z, right? Because people don't know. And some people, when they don't know, you get the two extremes, they just stick their head in the sand and assume it's forever, it won't, it'll never happen. And of course you might have people who panic and say, maybe it's here tomorrow, right? And neither extreme is good. You don't want to overreact, you don't want to underreact. Obviously there's probably more of a price to pay with fixing this sooner than you need to than that later, but, you, Ideally, you want to have an, an appropriate understanding of what the risk is and decide what your risk appetite is. It really depends what you're risking, okay? Like a five in six chance of something working. So only a one in six chance of failure, is that an acceptable risk? Depends. I wouldn't, Russian roulette is not a good risk decision, right? For other things, maybe I'll, I'll you know, it'll rain and I'll get wet. Not a big deal. Right? So it really depends on what we're talking about here, what the risks are. So what is Z? The truth is right now, nobody knows. Okay? And, and you, know, you also have to measure that risk in the context of, you know, a smart mathematician might break these codes without a quantum computer tomorrow. So the real question is, when does the risk of quantum cryptanalysis start to become material and exceed the sort of the background risk we're living with every day anyway? Right? And so Nobody knows what year it is. And saying, well, I don't think it's going to happen in 10 years, therefore do nothing, assume it's not, that's just wrong reasoning. It really depends on, well, how likely, if anyone ever says that, say, but how sure are you? What, what, what probability would you put on it? And if they say one in a thousand, say, oh, then, then how about I bet you $1 and you pay me $1,000 if you're wrong, right? Because if they're not willing to do that, they don't really mean it, right? And I actually have bets with people where they owe me $1,000 if this happens, I think, by 2028. 
uh, I owe them a dollar. If it doesn't, I'll probably, probably pay them a dollar. It's no big deal. I can afford it. Um, and if they're wrong, they could probably afford it too because they are a big stakeholder in a quantum computing company. <clears throat> so everybody wins here. But we, you know, the way we try to tackle this what is Z problem, I have my own methodology and my own estimates, but we interviewed 46 thought leaders. Actually, in 2019, we interviewed 22, then 44, and this year, 46. And we asked them, what do you think is the likelihood? These are the, the real deal, like people all around the world working on different facets of quantum computation, people whose opinions I turn to and you know, world leaders turn to to say like, what's going on here? Like what's happening? What's what remains to be done? Uh, and I asked them bluntly, what do you think is a like, what do you estimate the likelihood of quantum computer breaking RSA in five years? Now, most of us say probably not, right? But if somebody said, don't worry, there's only a 5% chance uh, the COVID-19 vaccine will kill you, most people wouldn't have taken it, right? So 5% is a material risk depending on what the stakes are. And critical digital platforms, the stakes are far too high to accept the 5% risk, right? So it starts to become material in five years. So what we did is we asked them, you know, zero to 1%, one to 5%, five to 30%, and so on. And if we average, you know, their opinions, you know, we get, so if we average the most pessimistic, because if somebody says between zero and one percent, the conservative, you know, assumption is to take zero percent, and if they say one to five, to take one percent. So if we take all the conservative estimates, the ten-year probability average is eighteen percent, and if we take the more optimistic, it's thirty-four percent. Right. So the actual, you know, effective actual average would be somewhere in that range, which is very material risk for. 10 years from now, which is not a lot of time to get ready. And, and yes, you could, you could say, well, probably not. Yeah, you know, there's a almost consensus that probably not in 10 years. Does that mean we could ignore it? No, because <laughs> the risk is, exceeds any reasonable risk tolerance for a critical digital platform, like a payment system, an energy grid, and, and so on and so on. And the risk becomes even higher at 15 and more years. So really what keeps me up at night is the five and 10 year uh, likelihoods where we cannot really accept these risks. I don't want to rush it. I don't want to panic because that will lead to other very costly mistakes. And this is the state of the art understanding of what, what the likelihood is. The German government, for example, is assuming uh, that quantum crypto analysis is possible by 2031. They're not conjecturing it will be. They're not saying it probably, they're just saying, we're going to act as if it is, probably because within their risk tolerance, there's a non-trivial chance that it is, and they're working backwards and making sure they're, well, at least, so they found two, two digital platforms already that they're starting to migrate. These are the kinds of risk decisions we need our leaders and the owners of our, you know, cyber systems and, and so on to be making. So it's really important to emphasize, I think this is becoming more and more clear, quantum computing is not a just an academic exercise anymore. About two, three years ago, I was listening to this you know, cybersecurity expert from the very renowned place. Somebody asked him about quantum, and he said, oh, it's still just professors and their grad students. It was already wrong back then. I pulled him aside and I said, look, that was sort of correct 15 years ago. Like you, That's just wrong right now. It's, it's dangerously wrong to give people the impression that, ah, don't worry about it. It's just academic, blah, blah, blah. The academic Part in all this is still super important. There's much more innovation, you know, fundamental discovery to accelerate. Like, I think we're going to build the ENIAC equivalent within some number of years, but we're going to want to make it better and faster and, you know, in many different ways. So we're going to continue to need fundamental research at universities to build better and cheaper quantum computers. Uh, plus, we're, there's still research gaps in building this quantum computer now. So academia has a tremendously important role. But the driving force in really integrating this into a working solution is being done in industry. Tens of billions of dollars all around, the, ten, many tens all around the world, leading you know, multinational enterprises, right? This is not an academic, in academia, if you wanna really put all the pieces together and there's 10 pieces and it's not really set up for that, right? And it's not a criticism of academia. We do kind of the impossible, inventive, you know, discover what no one else had ever thought of. 
right? When it, the more mission oriented activities, that's generally better done within industry, for example, typically. So, because in academia, if there's 10 pieces and you know, you got to apply for 10 different grants, wait for them to be accepted, you know, and you're not really rewarded for a lot of the more less inventive aspects of just engineering this thing and, and just getting it done, right? So there's a lot of creativity still required and a lot of just, you know, put your head down, just aggressive project management and, reason, you know, hiring the right types of engineers and so on to get it done. So industry is getting involved, multi-billion dollar corporations, very creative new startups, well capitalized now, hundreds of millions of dollars, billion dollar valuations, right? So the big players, as well as new players, we don't know who's gonna build the first large scale quantum computer that can break codes. We already have commercially available, largely research tool prototypes now, and they will evolve into these useful, large scale, useful machines for doing all sorts of wonderful things, drug discovery and so on. But if we wanna reap the positive rewards, we have to first take the threat off the table by deploying quantum safe cryptography. Uh, there's much going on in China as well. Again, tens of billions of dollars in, in, in government funded initiatives, industry, startups. And it's not just the hardware, the entire software, there's a whole ecosystem of, 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 of uh, software vendors, application companies, incubators to incubate companies and so on. Consortia of companies and so on. So that's, that's what you know, we can say now about Zet, when the threat is coming. We don't know exactly, but there's a material likelihood in five to 10 years. And we're gonna have to do it anyway. So it's not like it's wasted work to prepare for this migration. We just can't afford to be too late. How long will the migration take? Well, it depends on the complexity of your system, but many years. Fortunately, we've been working on it for many years, so we're not done, but really important milestones have been achieved in the United States, Europe, around the world. Waterloo and Canada are very involved. They're playing a leading role in many of these activities. One of the things we did, we let out of Waterloo was, you know, I once about eight years ago, I met a company, told them what I'm just telling you. And you realize, oh, I need to protect my file sharing product because my customers don't want their stuff compromised in 15 or 20 years even. And then I realized, he said, what, what do I do? And then I realized, well, well, nothing because you don't have, like this is very difficult. You know, cryptography must be implemented properly and very few people in the world can do that. And most people don't implement their own cryptography. They use either commercial product or open source robust open source. So we set out to, to implement and we designed and it's now running really well. It's a it's picking up you know major players around the world that are contributing. And it's been a great tool for people to, you know, because the crypto is just a building block. We need people to start building with it and, and making sure the migration will work. Right. When you change a fundamental piece of a complex system, it's not entirely clear it's going to still work. Right, so you got to start testing and investigating now. Uh, there's many other great initiatives in Canada in support of this, this vision. Um, one of the ways to achieve quantum cryptography over global distances is by leveraging satellites that can do quantum communication. Canada is one of the global leaders in this. In addition to co-inventing quantum cryptography, it's also one of the leaders in satellite quantum communication. Uh, our own, our government's, Cybersecurity Center has been following the quantum space and quantum safe crypto for many years and puts out regular guidance. Well, we have, you know, we're punching way above our weight in the quantum technology sector. We have a great information sharing network in cybersecurity. The government is now launching a new national quantum strategy to try to put, you know, in Canada, we have great opportunities. We need to get better at seizing them. So our national quantum strategy is focused on making sure we work together, fill the gaps, and leverage the opportunity we have. And just a few days ago, it was announced, uh, and Waterloo is one of the, the founders of this new initiative. Um, part of the, our national cybersecurity strategy uh, is, 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 founding a, is funding this national cybersecurity consortium um, to lead a, a new cybersecurity innovation network. So this will drive a lot more you know, research and application and collaboration across Canada in cybersecurity. 
great building blocks for Canada to be a leader in many things, including quantum safe, you know, cybersecurity in the quantum era. It's, it's really an area that we, you know, we literally coined the term quantum safe. Um, and this can be a flagship piece of a broader cybersecurity strategy for Canada because it's a necessary component. It's a very innovative component, which has workforce challenges, uh, economic opportunities, and so on. And it can also be a flagship part of our quantum strategy. Because again, you can't reap all the benefits of quantum computing unless you've protected our digital platforms to be safe against quantum-enabled attacks. So we're working together. Again, Canada's one of the foremost leaders here with colleagues all around the world to build a more robust cyber foundation for global digital infrastructures and the global economy. And a really important point is we probably wouldn't be doing this. Like there's a lot of vulnerability. The quantum threat is just one, right? And the vulnerability against just a smart mathematician breaking codes, in my opinion, is already unacceptably high. But we kind of live in if it ain't broke, don't fix it world. And it's really hard to motivate people to do something unless something bad happens and then you have to do it, right? We're good at cybersecurity, securing ourselves against attacks that are happening now. We're not as humans great at resilient building, proactively building resilience as we've seen with the pandemic. There's a lot of preventative measures we could and should have taken, we just didn't because, well, you know, when is that ever going to happen again? Uh, so we, we have vulnerabilities in our digital platforms and quantum is maybe that blessing in disguise that is forcing us to retool, rebuild, do things better. We kind of deep down know we should be doing them better. And quantum gives us a fundamental reason. You know, people don't change your behavior because they see the light. They change your behavior because they feel the heat. And quantum is really, you know, that threat is forcing us to do something. And now that we have that momentum to do something, let's really build a robust foundation for our future. So the choice is ours. Uh, we, we're totally capable of embracing all the wonderful things that quantum technology can do, can do for humanity and build an even safer cyber enhanced world, right? And to do that, of course, we just need to be proactive and take advantage of all the wonderful opportunities we have. So of course the answer is yes. I hope this was an interesting uh, information uh, and insights Sarah and I are sharing with you and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mikkel and Zara. Um, so we have time for questions. Uh, the audience, you can ask questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, um, Mikkel and Sarah would uh, take turns answering. Um, so perhaps I could ask one while we wait for the audience to get set up. Um, so, so you showed your sort of uh, average estimate from various experts about when quantum uh, cryptographically relevant quantum computers likely, and that was somewhere in the range of say 20, 10 to 20 years. But presumably this is not going to happen sort of all at once, right? So quantum computers are going to improve gradually. So is there a danger even before that, that there's some kind of hybrid classical quantum computer that can pose a threat to existing crypto system even before quantum computers themselves become sort of cryptographically relevant? I'm sure, maybe because I presented that part, I can answer that first. Um, there, there's two risks. Uh, we know, like there's a difference between necessary and sufficient, right? We know if you have 4,000 robust logical quantum bits, you can break today's codes, or most many of them. And you don't need much more to break Again, the public key code. So I don't want to get into the details, but symmetric crypto is, is you still have to do something, but it's, we've done those sorts of things before. Um, so that's what we know. But there, indeed, there's nothing, we're always looking for maybe a smaller quantum computer, indeed combined with great classical computing. I mean, I've worked on this actually, and we show that asymptotically, you can factor substantially faster with only, you know, so you need about n quantum bits, or four n, no, two n quantum bits to break an n, n bit number. We showed that n to the two thirds bits is technically enough, but that's sort of for large enough n. I don't think it's a threat, but something like that could suddenly work. So for one, we might drastically reduce the amount of quantum resources that we need to break these codes. 
right? <clears throat> that could happen any day. In fact, it could be zero quantum resources and just a smart classical attack. But, but quantum resources only add to the options adversaries have. And the other threat is some people sort of complacently assume some sort of Moore's law scaling. Oh, they, 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 they draw these curves extrapolating, which is completely missing the point about like, you don't, once you have a working module, you, you don't, you can buy many of them and, and network them, right? Moore's law is about miniaturization. We don't necessarily have to miniaturize. We just need to scale. People, it's not, it's not like we don't have a million qubits because we don't know how to build a million qubits. We know how to build them. They just don't work, right? So it's not like, you know, we have a three quarters of a vacuum tube and I'm going to scale it to, you got to get the bit to work robustly. Then we're going to start scaling them aggressively. And it's not going to be Moore's law like scaling. There's going to be some, you know, it's going to be rapid scaling, some roadblocks that will require some innovation and some more scaling. It's hard to predict the exact curve, but um, some people say, well, just sit back, relax. We'll see it coming. Yes, but for, again, for one, you, no one's going to promise you a 10-year or even a five-year lead time. Like once you have 10 working logical quantum bits, it's really not clear how many more years it will take to get 4,000. And not, not to mention, like you suggested, maybe you only need 400. Uh, so uh, the wait and see approach, in my opinion, is way too risky. Um, so it needs to be tracked uh, very actively. We need to be ready to move quickly if things move, if these unexpected things happen. So unexpected things for sure happen. We just can't tell you in advance which ones. Thank you. So we have a few questions on the Q and A. Uh, I think the first two questions are related. So perhaps uh, you could take them together. Uh, do you want me to read the questions? Or so maybe I can read the question for you. So the first question is: Do you have any advice, tips, insight for job hunting in the quantum industry? And the related question is: uh, Do you have any advice for people who are interested in working in the field of quantum technologies? Do you want to go, Sarah? Yeah, I go first, then you can ask you. So about the job job hunting, maybe if it was five or ten years ago, I would say that like write your CV like this, do that. I mean assuming that you have the necessary background to work on quantum computing uh, industry. But right now, if you already have like obtained all those skills that you need to, and you just have a LinkedIn account, you will see that you get tons of actually like job application from recruiter asking you to interview with them. Like the field is growing in a way that it was not ever before. But still, um, yeah, so yeah, it, it will not be a problem to find a job if you have obtained some skills related. There are a lot of industry, there are a lot of startups, especially in Canada, more like particularly in Waterloo right now, and also in Quebec, you can see like many, many, many startups with people from both industry and academia come together and started those which need uh, smart people who have this necessary skills to help them. Also like bigger companies are starting like, you know, looking into the field. So we might can add to it more. Yeah, I mean, you can go to the quantumindustrycanada.ca webpage and you'll see over 30 quantum companies. You can go to their web pages and, and see which ones look interesting to you. And then probably, you know, many of them have Many of them are actively recruiting, aggressively recruiting. And some don't need quantum expertise. They need just somebody to integrate the quantum pieces. And that's a great way to learn about quantum without necessarily knowing it coming in. Um, so so that's, I'm you know, assuming that these questions came from students. So perhaps a related question is if somebody is a you know, first year undergrad and they are interested in this sort of, what are the avenues that are open to them? Should they study physics? Should they study computer science and mathematics? So maybe, oh, I can go first, <laughs> maybe. I would say study something you really like because there's a quantum angle to just about anything. You know, so definitely in STEM, there's quantum meets engineering, chemistry, physics, computer science, mathematics, right? You, you can easily find those interfaces. And at Waterloo, by the time you're in third year, 
um, you can take a quantum information course. And even before that, there's countless courses online now where you can start to get a sense of what's going on. Uh, but you can pretty much Google whatever you're interested in quantum information, and you'll see some sort of meaningful interaction. Uh, but also even in the social sciences now, there's quantum policy, there's the economics of quantum and so on and so on. Uh, so there's pretty much do something you like, and that will steer you into which aspect of quantum you might want to specialize in. Sarah might want to add something. Oh, that was actually exactly what I would have to say, like as Mike said, choose a field in science and study it well, and then you can grasp, uh, like switch into quantum computing very easily by the end of your study during your undergrad. Thank you. As you know, CPI has uh, students from uh, arts, from health, from engineering and mathematics and so on. So um, I think it's useful to know that for them to know that there are different uh, aspects of uh, the quantum world where they can make a difference. Yeah, and you're very fortunate to be at Waterloo because like, I mean, I did my PhD in Montreal and I was super lucky to work with the, like one of the world leader in quantum cryptography, but Waterloo attracted me so much that I got a visitor researcher position during my PhD and I stayed here uh, throughout my PhD going back and forth between Montreal and Waterloo. Thank you. So the next question is from Derek. He says, I work for a small organization that needs to protect highly sensitive data uh, and for the long term. Uh, if I wanted to start turning my mind towards quantum proving this idea, what, where would be a good place to start? So um, there's a lot of great resources out there. Of course, when you look on the internet, it's never quite clear which resources are more reliable than others. Um, our Canadian, the CCCS, Canadian Cybersecurity Center, has a number of, of you know, pieces on quantum safe cybersecurity. Quantum Safe Canada, so quantum safe.ca, uh, has a number of resources there. I would say there's great Canadian companies that are globally recognized in this space. I'm trying to be unbiased here. One of them is led by me. So that's you know, one of the ones who, I mean, in my unbiased opinion, we do things like quantum risk assessments. So it depends what you want. But I think generally I advise grad, go through, understand what quantum is, assess, you do an assessment of what it means to your product and your customers, then roadmap, and then finally implement. If you want to get in, start getting your hand, like, you know, if you want to start working with actual tools, there's the open source platforms I mentioned to you. One, there's the openquantumsafe.org. That's the post-quantum algorithms. And if you're interested in mess, you know, playing with quantum cryptography, it's not a toy, but if you're interested in, you know, exploring quantum cryptography without buying expensive hardware, you can go to openqkdnetwork.org where there's open source. You simulate the quantum channels, but the rest is classical. You can simulate how it would work in your system. Uh, so, uh, oh, the other thing, um, there's a, well, if you go to the quantumsafe.ca, you'll get a link to the Canadian Forum for Digital Infrastructure Resilience, published in Quantum Safe Best Practices. That, you, that is pretty authoritative and has many references as well. So there's a lot of great resources, but I, you know, probably even find someone you trust to kind of be your, not to do it for you, but to be your Sherpa and answer your questions and make the best use of your time in this. Thank you. Um, so I think um, we have handled all the questions in Q&A. Um, both the speakers, thank you for agreeing to uh, record your talk uh, and uh, make it available. So when, uh, when we have done the editing, the, the video will be available on our YouTube channel. You can find the YouTube channel by going to the CPI webpage, uh, cpi.uworld.ca. Um, um, the next CPI talk is going to be on the 13th of uh, April. Uh, I think that's a Wednesday. Uh, and it'll be a talk by um, Dr. Seni Kamara, who is a cryptographer. And uh, um, uh, that, that will also be an online talk, um, at least the next time it's going to be online. Beyond that, we'll, we'll try to see uh, whenever possible, we'll, we'll host an in-person talk. Um, so at this point, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Michele and Sarah, and, uh, and thank you for staying up this late to 
and take a you know, time off when we have prime time in the evening to, to share your knowledge and experience with uh, the CPL listeners. Thank you very much. And it's have a nice pleasure. Bye-bye.